Hi, this is Paul Slack. It's Good News Broadcast. Speaking to Michael Eskin. Hi, Michael. How are you? Hi, Paul. I'm fine. Thanks for having me on your show. Well, I'm looking forward to having this conversation. Now, I, I do recollect that ours is good news. Now, uh, Michael is a prejudice uh, expert and has been uh, asked to go around the world uh, for the U.S. government and for other people and speaks about this often and has written a book called The DNA of Prejudice. Now, prejudice to me... Uh, Actually, depending on what the prejudice is, is not good news um, if it's prejudice in a negative sense. Is there a prejudice in a positive sense? Well, <laughs> it's good that you asked that question. It's actually the first time that anybody has asked me that question, although I deal with it in the book. No, there isn't. Even positive, preju positive prejudice is also always negative prejudice in disguise. And the reason for it is that, as I explain in the book, because prejudice is never directed at only one object, but at least at two, and most likely at much more, and many more than two. Um, if you have a positive prejudice towards someone, you simultaneously disparage, denigrate, or derogate from somebody else, because there's always a comparative element, and we can talk about it in a minute when I lay out the six conditions of prejudice of my book, but... No, there is no positive prejudice. You know, if you like someone simply because you like them, uh, for instance, I love my wife, right? And I, would you call that prejudice? Um, the, 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 uh, partial. Oh. <laughs> no, not partial prejudice. You're very partial to your wife. <laughs> I'm partial. Yes, that's right. And as we all know, there's a real difference between being biased and partial and being prejudiced. By far. And so... You know, I also love, for instance, I really love good Italian food. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Am I prejudiced or am I partial? Um, uh, you know, I guess the word prejudiced, uh, I don't know, what is the definition of prejudice in Webster's Dictionary? And the fact of the matter is all words are made up anyway to begin with, and we just put some thoughts to what well, they mean. Yeah, but you're absolutely right. But let's assume there's a real reality out there that is independent of words, and that the words we use to describe it may or may not fit that reality uh, in certain ways. So, you know, when we talk about prejudice, we really mean something real and not simply words. We really mean real events, real actions that we um, assess and evaluate in certain ways. So, for instance, when the Nazis killed several million Jews, these are real events based on real attitudes, and no matter how we describe them, we need to take cognizance of these events and these attitudes. It just so happens that historically we have used the term prejudice to describe the attitudes of Nazi Germans toward Jews. And this is where I come in with the book. I simply, uh, you know, uh, pay tribute to the fact that historically the word prejudice has been used for every occurrence and every event that we all agree on is negative and needs to be combated. Now, the word prejudice has also been used indiscriminately to describe many other things. But these negative, truly negative things, it has always been used to describe. And this is what I talk about when I talk about prejudice. I only talk about those kinds of prejudice that we all agree on should be fought, should be gotten rid of if possible. And one of the things, you know, you just mentioned um, this question of language and, you know, people call things by different names. Yes, of course, you're right. But at the same time, I mean, think of the following situation. Imagine you're going to a doctor's office and you come into the office and you have swellings on your body. And these swellings are simply pimples, right? Mm -hmm. Now, we have a word to describe these swellings. We could use different words to describe, this, uh, describe these swellings, but the important thing is that we know that whatever word we use, it really refers to a pimple and not to a malignant tumor that is also a swelling, potentially. Now, once we realize that we need to make a distinction between the tumor and the pimple, we also know that most likely the doctor will not perform surgery on the pimple, and at the same time, not overlook the severity of the uh, malignant tumor. And because these are two different things in real life, in the real body of a real person, we have historically evolved a whole language to describe these differences. 
And so, in a way, yes, we use all kinds of language to describe all kinds of things, but we, in a way, should not fall behind the achievements of language that we already have, namely, reserving the term tumor for one kind of swelling while reserving the term pimple for another kind of swelling. And if we make that distinction and maintain it, chances are we'll act appropriately when confronted with one or the other. And the same happens with prejudice. If we call everything prejudice that is somehow an opinionated action or negative attitude, what we do is we really dilute the severity of the real kind of prejudice and make simple opinions, bad or good, make much worse, look worse, look, make them look much worse than they really are. And what I try to do in the DNA of prejudice on the one and the many, the book that we're discussing, is first of all ask the questions, what is it that we're actually talking about when we talk about prejudice? Since not every bias, opinion, custom, tradition, etc. is prejudice. And once we've understood what it is that we're actually talking about, and it's not about words, it's about real realities out there, we will be able to act appropriately if we decide, one, that we're confronted with real prejudice, and if we decide that real prejudice, with a capital P, is something we should fight and try to defuse, defeat, and make go away if possible. But in order to be able to engage in the most appropriate kind of behavior and action, we first need to be able to diagnose what it is that we're dealing with, rather than tilting at windmills, potentially, and then we can decide what to do. And that's what I help my readers to achieve and the point that I help them to reach. So it's not, uh, not part of human nature? Absolutely not. One of the, you will hear many psychologists and sociologists make the claim that we're hardwired to be prejudiced. And, you know, when, they, when these things are stated, uh, there are two ways to interpret them in my view. The one is they actually don't mean prejudice with a capital P, but prejudice in a very diluted sense, and what they really mean is we're hardwired to have stereotypes, be opinionated, have biases, be part of traditions and cultures, follow custom, etc. And that's absolutely correct. In the same way that we are hardwired to be emotional, that we are hardwired to show emotion and act aggressively, right? Aggression is part of our human makeup. But it doesn't mean that we are hardwired to be murderers, because murder is a cultural notion that describes a certain kind of acting out of aggression. And nobody in their right mind would say that being a murderer is something we're hardwired to be. Because if that were the case, then murder is basically justified since that's who we are. And we all agree that that's not true. And the other way to read these kinds of statements that we're hardwired to be prejudiced that you'll find in sociolo sociological accounts and psychological accounts, to mention only two fields, is that really some people believe that we're hardwired to be prejudiced in the uh, sense of prejudice with a capital P, and that I simply think is completely mistaken. Because again, the same logic applies. If that's true, then you may as well claim that we're hardwired to be rapists and hardwired to be murderers and all kinds of other things that I don't think we are, and I think many would agree with me simply because it's empirically not tenable to claim this. And because we're not hardwired, because prejudice is a cultural phenomenon, pure and simple, it must be possible to fight it and to have antidotes to it. Is prejudice uh, different than racist? Well, racism, uh, you know, I would distinguish it as follows. Racism is a, is, is a constant and continuous uh, kind of profile of a person in whom a certain kind of prejudice has consolidated into a whole worldview and a, you know, a continuous and sustained mode of behavior. So racism consists of prejudices, and prejudice definitely feeds into racism, but, it, you know, racism is an abstract category that describes a state and not uh, a behavior, if you will. And a bigot? Well, a bigot, again, a bigot is not necessarily somebody who's prejudiced, because you have to determine what kind of bigot is that person. You know, if somebody, for instance, never ever eats or never um, fries anything with canola oil, right? Mm -hmm. Because he or she believes that canola oil is bad for you. 
Mm-hmm. Well, that's, in a way, a very narrow-minded attitude towards canola oil, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Would you call that person prejudiced? Mm-hmm. I just call them partial again. Again. You know. And that's already enough. You know, the w- you're wavering as to do I apply or don't I apply the term bigot or prejudice to this person, you know, shows that mm-hmm, there are so many facets uh, that uh, it behooves us to think uh, more deeply about the connotation and the context in which prejudice, prejudice can be applied. Let me give you an, another example. Um, uh, somebody who has two job applicants, right, an employer, one man and one a woman, and he hires the man because he believes that a woman will do a uh, worse job on the job. Would you say he's prejudiced? Um, I would say that that person is, um, well, it's based upon job skills. And if I guess they thought that there was a physical mm-hmm. limitation of strength, Okay. And they would have to then know prove because there's some very strong women. Yep. Um, uh, that that woman could not be as strong. I, I guess it's. I think it is a little bit of prejudice. So uh, I, I think you know your qualification is wonderful, because I made that you know I asked you a very, my question is very vague, and I completely you know I would I hope I would have answered it the way you answered it because you qualified it and yet you sense that there might be something that's going in the direction of prejudice. I think you're absolutely right. In this instance, let's assume, let's give, let's give the employer the benefit of the doubt and assume there's a real reason why he, uh, he or she hires the man instead of the woman because maybe there are physical limitations um, at the job, et cetera, et cetera. Now, let's, let's, let's um, flesh it out a little more. Let's assume the same employer has to choose between two candidates that are absolutely equal as determined by a third party, right? Mm-hmm. Both in terms of the professional skills the requirements of the job, and the expertise, and what they uh, stand to bring to the company. The one applicant is a man, the other is a woman. The employer, again, hires the man, because he says, well, women, that's my experience, the employer says, are not as good on the job as men. They want to get pregnant, they want to have children, they're not reliable. Would you say that's a prejudiced approach? Well, that I would say is a prejudiced approach. Exactly. And, uh, and, and and, 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 you know, and this is where my thinking, you know, this is where my thinking about this, uh, on this topic took me. And I started asking myself, so what makes all of these cases so different? And what I realized, again, extracting what life itself gives me, right? In, in the books of DNA Fridges, there's nothing that I impose on life. There's nothing that I tell people they should think that they can't actually extrapolate from what's already out there all the time. And I realized that in order for an opinion, judgment, or action to be really sensibly considered an action based on prejudice or an opinion held with prejudice, quote-unquote, there have to be six criteria in place. And let's look at the employer and the two candidates as just by way of an example, okay? okay? Because you can apply these criteria like a diagnostic toolkit onto anything, and it will simply... This toolkit will help you diagnose what you have. It will help you diagnose the tumor and distinguish it from the pimple. Or it will help you realize, wow, that's only a pimple, although it looks like a tumor. And that's precisely what we were dealing with when you were wavering. Is it or is it not? Well, you intuitively decided, and based on preliminary thinking, not quite yet. And in the second case, you said, well, actually, yes, that is, that is prejudice. So what are the six criteria? Let's look at the example of the employer. So, number one, he knows... Well, we know, first of all, the first condition is the employer must be of sound mind, right? Mm -hmm. That's a given. If the employer is determined to be nuts in whatever shape or form, or crazy, or temporarily insane, temporarily insane, it doesn't really make sense to call him or her prejudiced, because then the whole concept of prejudice collapses, because it um, drains the whole notion of prejudice um, of responsibility and the aspect of being responsible for what you do is really important right correct sure so the first condition is the employer has to be of sound mind and by extension everybody who holds prejudice has to be of sound mind to be considered prejudiced second condition we determine that the employer knows that both candidates are 
of equal value when it comes to the job and the performance and what is expected, right? Mm -hmm. And he still continues to persist in an opinion he apparently held before that the woman is less qualified because she's a woman, right? Mm -hmm. Now this means that, and you call this employer prejudice. So again, we're dealing with, you already said he's prejudiced, and now we're asking, now why would you say that? And once we determine why you are correct, we can apply this knowledge to all other in, you know, situations in which this happens and help ourselves understanding what's going on. Why is he prejudiced? Precisely because he knows that he's wrong, but he still maintains that wrong opinion and acts on it. Now, this is very counterintuitive because the majority of people you will poll and the majority of dictionary definitions you will consult will actually tell you that a prejudice is a judgment made prior to possession of sufficient knowledge. So it's a prejudgment based on lack of information. That's the common understanding of prejudice. And that's simply misguided and wrong. Because in real life, opinions based on lack of knowledge are precisely that. Opinions, wrong opinions, faulty opinions, um, assumptions. We have many words for them. And we apply them to people. And what we do in these situations typically we help them by giving them information. That's what happens in school, at university. That's what happens all the time in our lives, and we don't call students, pupils, uh, learners, prejudiced. We simply call them ignorant. And ignorance does not equal prejudice. On the contrary, prejudice is based on knowledge. Okay. Now let's go back to the employer. He is of sound mind. He has sufficient evidence to the contrary not to hold the opinion he holds. What else does he do? One could say that he's positively prejudiced towards the man, right? Mm -hmm. Because he hires him. Now, there are some people who think that positive prejudice is a great thing because it, it helps us determine and help other people and determine whom we should help in this world that is so messy and chaotic and difficult to see through. But if the employer, let's add another twist to it, said to his son, look, you will be my successor in the family business because I simply want my son to succeed. I'm not going to look at any other candidate. Candidate, You'll be it. One could say that he's positively prejudiced towards his son, right? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, is he? Isn't it everybody's right to yeah, simply choose it? So maybe thing. prejudice does not apply to the son, but it certainly applies to the man if he's hired as opposed to the woman. Right. And this is where we get to the third point. Positive prejudice is prejudice nonetheless, and, you know, in truth, a negative prejudice, because in being positive towards one person, it is automatically negative towards another person with which the first person is being compared. Prejudice always involves comparison. If there's no comparison and a comparative evaluation, there's no prejudice. Mm -hmm. Michael, you know, we got a lot of information here, yes. right? And uh, this is an important subject matter to me, um, and I would like to speak with you at a later moment again Anytime. about this. Uh, uh, and I'll tell you t a couple reasons quickly why, because uh, i got to run to another interview. But the thing here is why. I started in the television business 38 years ago because there was a show called All in the Family. Yes. All in, and I got the honor to get to work on that show at CBS when I was with CBS many years ago. Okay, and uh, what I would always say is that that show, you know, you could see what a, a bigot, I called him, actually, yeah. uh, lear, you know, lived like uh, and spoke like and thought like. But you would laugh at the laugh at the bigot, and you laugh with the bigot. Yes. Um, and that kind of a show was, in my mind at that time, was the uh, one of the perfect quintessential TV shows that would help to educate people about what is a bigot. Yes. Okay. So, so for me, you're talking about a subject that's very, very important to me. Mm. Okay. Well, I'm very glad um, that. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. And I've continued on yes. in that manner. Yes. with uh, now after many, many shows and then starting Multicultural Marketing and Advertising Company, another situation, and I always have mentioned that I have uh, brought up in Multicultural Marketing, you reached my mother in a Jewish media or a yeah, Hungarian yeah. newspaper, mm -hmm. and so I, I'm still into the, you know, those things. And then the Good News broadcast, you know, what somebody might want to say is good, and I've deemed this 12 years now we're going, you know, what what might be good to somebody might not be good to somebody else, okay? Yeah. And uh, on the other hand, also, 
uh, prejudice. Um, I, I, you know, I'm an editor in chief, you could say, right? And yes. uh, it's still my opinion of what I think the situation is. Absolutely. So I always quote the Little Prince, which says, uh, "Only with thy own heart can I see rightly." <laughs> you know, uh, absolutely. And in a way, what I come out with and what I tell my readers. If you, because, you know, we, we talked about the three conditions, the three other conditions to make it six is that you never act as, a, as a, an individual when you're prejudiced, but as part of a group. Mm -hmm. You never see an individual, but you always see the group through the individual and the individual in light of the group. And you never only have one bad opinion about that individual, but more than one. So in order to combat prejudice, you know, as you said, you see clearly with thine own heart, you actually have to learn to see the one and not the many. I agree with you, and it's always about the one. Absolutely. It's the one facing you right in your push. And uh, um, and in the best of your ability, I'm an interfaith minister also, uh, in my mind, you need to be non-judgmental. Well, you need to allow them to be... Point, that's right, and the question that I pose at the end are. of the book is, how do we get to that point? And this is where I come in, you know, in a kind of therapeutic manner, helping people create those situations in which we suspend judgment, but, you know, even suspending judgment is only one component. You can suspend judgment and still see not Paul Slatkus, but an American. Oh, right. Well, that's a whole other thing. I'm, a, know, jo I'm a John Leninist. I don't believe in countries. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, you can see a trade unionist. You can see yeah, an editor-in-chief. Yeah. What we have to learn is to be able to switch all the time between this kind of general perception of the ones surrounding us and at the same time seeing really Paul. Michael. We're John. brothers and sisters, bottom line. Well, even, you know, we even have to go beyond that in a way and not only think of ourselves as brothers and sisters, but really as absolute individuals who then also are brothers and sisters. A hundred percent, because uh, I agree with that as well. Michael, we have a lot to talk about. Thank you so and much, And I'd like Paul. to speak with you again. I'm on Thank the Upper you. West Side. I see you got the West well, Side group. Um, uh, we have a concert on Sunday I'm going to invite you to. Well, um, Thank you so much, Paul. All right, Michael, thank, thank you. you very bye -bye. much. Bye-bye.